Cindy Domingo's community activism within Asian American, Filipino, and labor circles began in the 1970s, and probably some of you were around for that. So thank you for coming. Um, she was active in campaigns against the Marcos government and with the KDP Union of Democratic Filipinos after her brother Silmi Domingo was assassinated along with fellow union leader Jean Fiernes, she served at this, as the national chair for the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Viernes. The campaign resulted in the conviction of former ILWU local 37 president and family friend Tony Baruso for organizing the assassination, which it turned out had been ordered by the Marcos regime with U.S. government knowledge. Cindy Domingo was an active member of the Washington State Rainbow Coalition in the 80s, and she's since served on many boards uh, of many social justice-oriented organizations since then. And she's currently Chief of Staff for King County Council member Larry Gossett, so continues to serve. She's, yes, that's wonderful. She'll speak about the book, A Time to Rise, Collective Memoirs of the Union of Democratic Filipinos, KDP, which she edited with Rene Siria Cruz and Bruce Osena. Also on our program tonight is Seattle-based public interest attorney, Michael Withy, and he has worked to protect constitutional rights, civil rights, and human rights over the past 42 years. He was a very close friend of Silmi and Jean and worked on the case to bring the perpetrators of their murders to justice. His cases also include those against Boeing, Exxon, General Motors, and the Seattle Police Department, and he's the former president of the P Public Justice Foundation. Michael and his Committee for Justice for Domingo and Viernes legal team celebrated an unprecedented victory in his case against the Marcos regime, winning a $15.1 million federal court jury verdict, and then negotiating a $3 million settlement on behalf of the estates of Domingo and Viernes. He tells the story of the case in summary execution, the Seattle Assassinations of Silmi Domingo and Jean Viernes, which was published last February. So please join me in welcoming Cindy Domingo to our stage. Thank you. Thank you to my friends in the audience and some people that I haven't seen for a long time, um, and uh, my family, of course. And uh, what I'm gonna do is just say a little bit about the book. Um, in terms of what's in the book, why, I feel, why we feel it was very important, even though it took us over 20 years to accomplish. And then I'm going to read, um, actually I'm gonna read from something I wrote about Salmi and Jean's murder. Uh, usually I read my favorite uh, story, which is not my story, <laughs> but somebody else's story about was it all worth it. But I'm, uh, tonight I'm gonna read from my story. Uh, to lay the groundwork for Mike's presentation. So, um, you know, it's, and it's an honor and privilege to be here with Mike. Um, you know, in 1981, we never realized that we would be here 37 years later, reopening this case. And Mike's gonna talk about that. Uh, we had all committed from day one when Salmi and Jean died, that we would not rest until full justice was accomplished in Salmi and Jean's murder, murders. And uh, we thought that, you know, that might take us two, three years. Um, it took us nine years to bring what we uh, did in the civil suit. And here we are, I think it was almost 37 years to the date, we were at the FBI office saying, what are you gonna do about the evidence before you? the U.S. was involved in this murder, and you need to reopen the case. So um, it has been an effort of love, of commitment, but also a commitment to expose the role that the U.S. government plays in surveilling, harassing, and ultimately helping to murder Salmi and Jean uh, because they were practicing their democratic rights. So, um, you know, A Time to Rise, as I said, took probably about 22 years to accomplish. 
It was a collective effort that was done by the former members of the Union of Democratic Filipinos, the KDP, which was the only national organization, radical organization of Filipinos, an organization that was made up of both of Filipino nationals, those that immigrated to this country uh, out of natural immigration, but also because of uh, coming to this country out of exile for fear of their lives and their activities under the U.S. Marcos dictatorship that was uh, um, implemented in, that was declared in 1972. And our organization had 10 chapters around the country, even though probably the government thought there were a thousand members of the KDP, there was probably no more than 200, 250 members of the KDP. But we were committed, disciplined, uh, we would move to another city at the request of our national, we would take up work wherever the demands were needed. And when Salmi and Jean were murdered, many people were transferred to, the, to Seattle to help win justice for Salmi and Jean. Our mission was, uh, we had two parts to our program. One was that we wanted an ending to the Marcos dictatorship and we wanted an end to U.S. support for the dictatorship. And based off of that um, goal, we built a broad-based alliance, a front, that would help us end the dictatorship, which was accomplished in 1986. Our second part of our program was to fight for dem democratic rights in the United States. Uh, which we did from the organization lasted from 1973 to 1986 with the ultimate goal of implementing socialism in this country. So it was a two-pronged program that uh, the organization was committed to and we had a very close relationship in our establishment and our ongoing work up until about the early 1980s with the Communist Party of the Philippines and the New People's Army. But at a certain point, because of political differences over strategy, uh, probably in 1983, we broke our ties with that left movement. We felt that this book, even though it took us 20 years to accomplish, was an important book to finish. Important because it's very rare that people of color get to tell their history. It's very rare. Because who usually tells our history? Usually white males, of course, Mike wrote his book, but <laughs> with, with our input. <laughs> but it's very important for people of color to tell our own history through our own lens and through our own words. And through that, um, we were able to accomplish that. And oftentimes it's not the people who make the history that get to write our history. And so the 40 stories that are in this book are all written by members of the KDP. And they're written in a collective fashion. We went around the country and held writing retreats. And over the years, we were able to eke out one or two stories. But in the end, we came up with a book with 40 stories. And the majority of them were women. I noticed in the audience today, the majority of women, and bravo for women. <laughs> but it speaks also to the role that women played in the organization in leading the struggle to overthrow the dictatorship as well as to win the democratic rights for Filipino Americans in this country. And it was important to tell this story because we are still alive. The majority of us in the KDP are still alive. Uh, unfortunately, three of our members died this year, and a couple of them have stories in this book. So it's a lasting memory in terms of their work, in terms of our work together and their commitment, that their stories are memorialized in this book. And again, how often do we get to tell our own stories? This book is many things. It's the human stories of people that sacrificed their personal memories, of what they went through as activists during that period of 1973 to 1986. It tells of their struggles in taking up working class struggles, juggling family, 
personal commitment, race and gender identity, and a youth perspective because we were still in our 20s and some earlier, I mean younger than their 20s at the time we were involved in the KDP. Um, obviously we're not that young anymore, so. <laughs> and it's important for our children to understand what we were doing during that period of time. But it is also not many things, it is not the definite history of the KDP. And we leave that to someone in our organization to write. We're trying to encourage Renee Syria Cruz, one of the editors, who's a real writer. Uh, he was the editor and writer of our Ankatapuna, our national newspaper, and continues to be an editor and writer of um, Filipina Inquirer. Uh, .net, an online uh, new, um, newspaper source. Uh, and so we're hoping that that history will also be written, and within that history, our struggles with the Philippine left about strategies both in this country as well as in the Philippines. And this book is important especially because what we did not know that when we published this book that the situation in the Philippines would be in even more dire crisis than it was under the dictatorship of Ferdinand and Emil de Marcos. As many of you may know, the Marcoses have resurrected their power in the Philippines. We have, um, you know, some would say he's crazy, but uh, he's like very much like Trump in this country in terms of the misogyny, except he has a free hand to order murders in the name of a drug war. Over 25,000 people have been killed as a result of the drug war in the Philippines. You can be targeted just by saying, he's a drug addict, she's a drug addict, he's a seller, or whatever. And many of the people, most of the people are innocent, but they are extrajudicial killings, killed at the whim of the Philippine National Police or whomever feels that they have a right to kill a so-called drug dealer or a seller. So, um, you know, the book is um, called A Time to Rise, and um, it is divided into, it. there's a very good section which places the political conditions that gave rise to the KDP, both in the United States and in the Philippines. It is divided into four sections, uh, one is called The Beginnings, which is a number of stories which talks about how people became activists and how they were recruited into the, into the KDP. And, um, you know, they're very humorous stories in terms of uh, somebody just being invited to a party and then being recruited in the KDP uh, to uh, David Della, whose name of the story is A Little Red Book. And it's about a little red book called Philippine Society and Revolution, and he was asked to read it. And he was recruited as a high school student at Cleveland High School. The second uh, section is called In the Thick of the Struggle, which talks about the many different campaigns that the KDP took up. So while we were central, as I said, to the, um, the uh, coalition that was brought together to overthrow the Marcos dictatorship and to end U.S. support for the dictatorship in 1986. We also did a number of campaigns dealing with um, defending nurses. I do it again by Esther Simpson, whose son is here tonight with his wife. Um, there is Working the Corridors of Power, Odette Polenton, who talks about our congressional task force. We were actually a little bit more sophisticated during that part of, uh, during that period because uh, we had multi-strategies in terms of accomplishing our work. So we believed in working in Congress to, over, to end U.S. support uh, in which we worked with uh, in a broad united front with people that we didn't necessarily have long-term strategic relations with, but our unity was to end U.S. support for the dictatorship. A Cultural Gypsy by Ermina Vinluan, who actually just recently passed of uh, cancer, talks about the cultural arm of the KDP, 
We had a cultural arm that produced record, a record, uh, literature pieces, and, a, and different plays that traveled across the country uh, on the struggle of Mindanao, the nurses' struggle. Uh, we had a cultural group here in Seattle that talked about the effort to destroy, uh, or maybe I should say the effort to save the International District as a, as a neighborhood. And then, um, so those are the types of stories in the thick of the struggle. The third section, which is dedicated, is called the Testifier, and that is dedicated to the struggle around the murders of Salmi and Jean that Mike is gonna talk about. Salmi and Jean were killed as a result of standing at the intersection of the labor movement and the anti-dictatorship movement. And when they brought those two movements together and tried to send an investigating team to the Philippines to investigate the horrible working conditions uh, of working people there, the illegality of trade unions in the Philippines, they were murdered before their work could, could come to fruition. And that's what happened on June 1st, 1981 in Pioneer Square. And so many of these stories talk about that struggle. You have um, uh, David Della, A Day I'll Live With for the Rest of My Life, and that is the story about how he was the first one on the scene right after the murders and had to identify Jean's body. How Do I Size a Bulletproof Vest by Chris Melrow is about what does it take after that? She didn't know anything about a bulletproof vest. And so how do you go about buying a bulletproof vest? How do you measure people? You know, and this, this was occurring like two days after the murders. So there was no time for grief, no time for crying, but we had to bury our comrades and go back to the work in order to make sure that the assassin's work of ending Salmi and Jean's work was not accomplished. And then Jim Douglas, uh, who also passed away, one of our lawyers defeating the Marcoses in a court of law. And he talks about the long struggle and the role he played and what it meant for him to be part of this justice effort. And then the last part is looking back. And a couple of these stories are written by children of the KDP. Uh, one of them is called Revolutionary Baby by Rebecca Apostol, who talks about what it was like to be a child of these KDP activists who were always going to meetings. <laughs> and Salahis Taverna, Scooby-Doo growing up with the KDP. And, um, and then my, my favorite story, which is by Edwin Batungbakal, is called No Regrets. And that story really speaks to my heart about after you make all this sacrifice, was it really worth it after the organization dismantled? And what you had hoped for to happen in the Philippines didn't occur. Uh, so was it really all worth it, all those years of struggle, all those years of sacrificing uh, because many people stopped going to school, stopped having, uh, didn't have a family, put off having children, and so was it all worth it in the end? And uh, so you'll have to read how he sums that up. Uh, and then there are a couple of documents uh, which uh, it's called Orientation to Philippine Support Work in the Current Period, which in essence was our final document which ended our relationship with the Philippine left. So I hope you will pick up the book and read it. And to close, I'm going to read from my article, uh, which when I look at this article, I think I had like about 15 drafts. <laughs> and I started working on this, um, you know, in the, in the, um, retreat that was held with the Seattle people. It was held, you know, I wanna say almost 10 years after the murders. And it was the first time that we sat down as a group to review, to digest, to feel what it was like all those years. And it was a very, very emotional time 
for people who had to set aside their grieving process for many, many years. Uh, that's when David Della wrote his story about first seeing Jean's body first, and this is when I wrote, began to write this, this story about Long Road, entitled Long Road to Justice. There are still times when in the midst of a joyous event or an important meeting, I find myself silently thinking that my brother Salmi should be there. I want to see him strut into the room, bringing with him the life of the party, joking and giving everyone a high five as he passes every person who knows him. With his shaggy, stylish brown, black hair, his red leather coat, velveteen pants, and platform shoes that distinguished him from other activists, he wouldn't be out of place amid today's quirky fashion styles. Even the burgundy Chevy Monte Carlo that Salmi drove, which became his trademark, would be seen as a classic today. And for, for a moment when I think of him, I'm stuck in time. It seems impossible that Salmi has been dead for over 30 years. At the time of Salmi and Jean's murders in 1981, I was assigned to the national headquarters of the KDP in Oakland in the National Education Department, designing and guiding internal studies for the organization. However, much of my political work was the development and guidance of study circles for the Marxist-Leninist Education Project, MLEP, a new project launched by the Line of March, a communist formation. As part of my work, I was assigned to assist the MLEP in Seattle, thus requiring tracking down Sami for discussions. In early May, I joined many of the KDP, Seattle KDP people, including Salmi and Jean, in Hawaii to attend the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union, ILWU International Conference. Jean was flying in directly from the Philippines, bringing with him a letter from Felix Berto Olalia, president of the Kilosang Kilosong Mayo Uno KMU or May 1st movement, inviting the ILWU to send a labor delegation to the Philippines to investigate the working conditions of Filipino workers under the regime of Ferdinand and Milda Marcos. ILWU Local 37, Alaska County Workers Union, which Salmi and Jean represented, sponsored Resolution R34 to send the investigating team. It was one of two controversial resolutions at the convention. The other concerned the power that pensioners led by legendary ILWU President Emer Emeritus Harry Bridges would continue to have in the ILWU. I had never attended a labor convention, and even though my main reason for being in Hawaii was to vacation, I sensed the historical importance of this event and attended some of the sessions. For months, Local 37 had been preparing for this resolution. The proposal was carefully worded so as not to completely arouse the full opposition of the ILWU's pro-Marcos members. The Local 37 KDP members understood the dangerous implications of the resolution. While Jean's first visit to the Philippines fulfilled an important personal purpose, Thank you. To visit his family's, his father's family, the trip was also part of a historical strategy that had been handed down from Carlos Bulasan and Chris Salvis Sr., officers of Local 37's decades before. So after the murder, I was flown directly to Seattle. And upon arriving in Seattle, comrades took Dale and me directly to Harborview Hospital to await news of Salmi's condition. Jean had already been declared dead at the Union, and more than 100 people passed through the waiting rooms, the majority of whom our family didn't know, bringing us food, asking it, is there anything they could do, comforting us and giving support to the others that were also there. Conspic conspicuously, conspicuously missing was the president of the Union, Tony Baruso. He finally came to the hospital after my mother called him, questioning why the president of the union was not interested enough to see Salmi or inquire about his condition. 
All Baruso asked was, what do you know? Who did it? After Baruso was told, he said nothing. What could he say? After all, he was close to one of the murderers, Jimmy Ramil. His silence spoke of his complicity to the crime. 25 hours later, at 5 a.m., after several operations, dozens of pints of bloods and, attempt, and attempts on Salmi's part to name another accomplice in the murders, he died in the trauma unit at Harborview. And then uh, a few weeks later, the Committee for Justice was formed. Um, we were able to get three of the hitmen uh, found guilty of murder and were sentenced to life in parole. But in September 1982, the civil suits were filed and the CJDV work went national. Slowly, more evidence was uncovered through the murder trials of the hitmen. Moreover, the findings of a private investigator with ties to government intelligence confirmed what we already knew, that the orders for the murders came from the Philippines and that the U.S. government was fully complicit in the surveillance and harassment of the U.S.-based anti-Marcos movement. We filed our civil suit to coincide with the Marcos' first state visit to the U.S. at the invitation of then-President Ronald Reagan. As activists, we knew that timing was everything, and since the national press would cover the Marcos visit, our civil suit had a good chance of getting picked up. But back then, Seattle was a backwater town without its number one in the nation status for its traffic problems or its number one status as the most livable city. The media was not interested in what seemed an implausible international murder case. And while the press and legal circles laughed behind our backs, we knew the U.S. and Marcos government continued to watch us. However, just as we had been so naive about the seriousness of Selma and Jean's work at the time of their deaths. We were caught by surprise when the federal judge assigned to our civil suit, Judge Donald Forhees, dismissed all the defendants, including the Marcoses and the U.S. government agencies. We were left with the Philippine government, Baruso, and the hitmen as defendants. And by the end of December 1982, there was little hope that we would be able to continue our work. The Marcoses had won this round, and even in Washington, D.C., our lobbying efforts for assistance in uncovering U.S. complicity in the murders were met with little support. Therese Rodriguez, who was the um, Washington, D.C. head of the Committee for Justice, tried to coach me to be a grief-stricken sister and not to come on too heavy with the anti-Marcos politics. Leave that to O'Dad and me, Tree said. You must try to appeal to their humanity. But I left Washington, D.C. unable to feel any humanity when one congressional aide told me that we should come back when something more serious happened. I asked myself, well, what could be more serious than the murders of two U.S. citizens by a foreign dictatorship on U.S. soil? Our request, our request for a public congressional hearing on the use of Philippine and U.S. agents to infiltrate, spy on, and harass members of our movement fell on deaf ears. Only Democratic Congressman Ron Dellums from California, Mike Lowry from Washington, and John Conyers from Michigan lent their support from the beginning, but their demands for U.S. government accountability were silenced. Finally, in 1986, when the Marcoses were overthrown by the People's Power Movement, Mike Withy and I traveled to the Philippines in the hope that the Corazon Aquino administration would help us. After all, I thought, even though Cory Aquino was president of the Philippines, she could understand the need for justice, especially since her husband had, so been, had also been so brutally murdered in the international eye. Call it naivety again but that help never materialized. Perhaps it was because Corey had other things to worry about, including warding off several coup attempts. Perhaps she was unwilling to implicate her own military and the U.S. government in the deaths of thousands of opponents of the Marcos dictatorship, including Salmi and Jean. After all, in the end, Corey never received justice in her own husband's murders, murder. In 1989, we succeeded in bringing our civil suit to trial. 
when we said that we would not rest until we brought the Marcoses to court, we didn't realize that it would take us eight and a half years of work. I remember clearly the final day of the trial in 1989, as December 14 was also my 36th birthday. As Mike prepared to give his closing statement, I looked around the packed courtroom of over 100 people, standing room only. After so many years, people remembered Salmi and Jean. And even though everyone had gone their own separate way, over the years, they had all come back to fulfill the promises they made back in 1981. Mike Kozu, who in 1981 had slept on my mother's living room floor to ensure our family's safety, came back to Seattle to help us. Marlene Pedregosa, my best friend, worked her magic and pulled together an organizing team to mobilize the trial since the KDP, the Coalition Against the Marcos Dictatorship, and the Line of March no longer existed. And for a moment, the movement that we had known before existed again. And for the first time, I felt that I had fulfilled my promise to Selma and Jean, that I would not rest until justice was served. It was such an emotional moment and my eyes filled with tears. I didn't need a verdict to tell me what I already knew. We had won because Selma and Jean were present in the faces of every person who was in that courtroom. And some of you were in that courtroom. To me, that was what justice was, building a movement that would not forget. I stayed with the Committee for Justice until the very end, the spring of 1991. And by then we had won the civil suit, seen Tony Baruso finally tried and imprisoned for life without parole in 1990 and collected damages from the Marcos estate. The judge and the jury awarded the family a total of $23.3 million, but hunting down the Marcos family money turned out to be a difficult task. People always ask me how I stuck it out so long, because others in the CJDV came and went, moving on to other things in their lives, whether having children or becoming involved in other issues and political arenas. But for some, like myself, we knew there was no option we had to see this to, e to the end. As I remember my old CJDV speeches, they're actually sitting on my desk at work, <laughs> I really believed that we would get justice for Selma and Jean no matter how long it took. In fact, when I looked at some of my work now, I'm still trying to get justice for Selma and Jean by ensuring that people do not forget their legacy. Recently, my son's physical education teacher asked him if he was related to the guy who was murdered years ago because my son's middle name is Salmi Domingo. And my son said yes. I knew through such incidences that Salmi and Jean are remembered. My only wish now is that Mike Withy would come to me today, which he did, and tell me that a piece of damning evidence has surfaced revealing the US complicity in the murders and without any hesitation, I know that Mike and I would be ready to organize again to write the final chapter of this book, which we are doing now. So I present Mike. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, <laughs> it was made to look like a dispute over dispatch. Hot-headed Filipinos shooting it out in the local Union Hall. Vicious thuggery. No one would survive that hail of bullets that day. No one would live to tell. It would be quick. It would be easy. There would be no witnesses. But the one thing that those hit men didn't count on was the incredible courage of Selmy Domingo with four 45 caliber bullet holes in him, seeing his best friend, Gene Varanus, bleed out on the Union floor, chasing the hitman out of the Union Hall, hailing down a fireman, and uttering those two words that would begin to unravel this murder conspiracy, Ramil and Galois. The one thing that Selmy must have thought in that moment was I must get outside, this cannot stand. 
we must bring the perpetrators of this foul deed to justice. That was his wish, and we must answer it. The other thing that the perpetrators of this murder didn't count on was the incredible courage and dedication of Cindy Domingo, the entire Domingo family, Terry Mast, Barbara Viernes, and the entire Viernes family, who for years and years suffered from the intimidation of the Tulasan gang that committed the murder, suffered from the ongoing presence of Tony Baruso in their lives, had to organize the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Varenas and bring about justice. That is who my book is dedicated to, Cindy and Terry. <laughs> Except for that last piece about the book, that was the closing argument I gave before the jury who had as a forewoman an incredibly courageous woman named Linda Barber. Linda, are you here tonight? Thank you so much. The foreperson of our jury in the Marcos trial, Linda Barber, has decided to come. When we, um, when we were in court during the Ramil and Galois trial, the testimony went so well. Selmy's dying declaration that Ramil and Galois had committed these murders was admitted into evidence. Jamie Malabo testified he saw Ramil and Galois coming down the alley. All the witnesses came forward. And it was a very, very strong case. Little did we know that in the 11th hour of the defense case, a mystery witness appeared. A mis mystery witness who claimed he was an eyewitness was in the phone booth across the street from the Union Hall, saw two men go into the Union Hall, but they didn't look like anything like Ramil and Galois, and then went over to aid Selmy, supposedly, ask him who shot him. And this mystery witness took those two words out of Selmy Domingo's mouth and said Selmy didn't know who shot him. We were flabbergasted. The prosecution had a weekend to figure out how to cross-examine. And somehow the prosecution found out that this person, whose name was Levain Forsyth, had testified on behalf of the Howard Hughes Mormon Will case. And we looked at that, and uh, the, I remember Lane Coe with the, the, the blackboard that night at the Committee for Justice saying, who is this guy? We thought maybe he's a wacko, maybe he's a Martian, maybe he's a, a paid witness. But folks, what we didn't realize, but found out five years later, and then more recently, a few months ago, was that this man, Levane Forsyth, was in fact an informant for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And someone, a control agent for the FBI, had sent Forsyth to the scene of the murders on June 1st, 1981, in order to find out what happened. We took his deposition, and he said he was an FBI informant for many years, was very close to, was a bag man for Howard Hughes, the reclusive billionaire, had known Robert Mayhew, who was the right hand of Howard Hughes, who was who the CIA used to contact the mafia to assassinate Fidel Castro. I'm not making this stuff up. But unfortunately, as Cindy talked about it, the judge dismissed the United States government and said, I want to hear anything about some FBI informant. So years and years later, we, we, Sharon Maida and I brought a Freedom of Information Act request. And we found out for the first time that not only was Forsyth an FBI informant, but he was an informant out of the Seattle office of the FBI. So Cindy and Terry and Sharon and I went to the FBI office with this information, say, what is going on here? You've got some, you've got some explaining to do. And they sent it, believe it or not, to the Department of Justice Inspector General's office. And what I've done over the past month is put together a memo that details exactly what the FBI knew and when they knew it. So this guy, Forsyth, was an FBI informant that, that planted electronic surveillance equipment that was told to go to a stand in a particular location, go to a restaurant, go to a location, and then to observe what happened and write a report. And he did write a report on June 1st. But he didn't remember who he sent it to. But we have that report, and it exonerated 
not only the hitmen, but that some, somebody didn't know who named them. On June 1st, the FBI informant had already prepared his testimony, which was perjury and obstruction of justice. He also uh, uh, taped a conversation he had with Joanne Maida, who was a prosecuting attorney, telling her, well, you just tell me what to say to bleed her into prosecutorial misconduct. But who was, who was it that ran Forsyth? Who was it that controlled him? My book is not only a bucket list of one, not only a commitment I made to Cindy and Terry, but it's an invitation to get involved. It's an invitation for activism. Because we have now an FBI petition to the Department of Justice Inspector General's office that asks these questions of what happened. And what we know is there are three investigations going on at the same time in June of 1981. Of course, there was the murder investigation when the FBI jumped in, started interviewing everybody. They sent 42 agents into the field to canvas all, all that was involved. And then mysteriously, the FBI agent in charge of that investigation was offered an unsolicited job at Sealand Corporation, and he took it and left. What we now know is that in addition to that investigation, which went nowhere, and which itself was part of the cover-up, that the FBI, for nine years before the murders, had had an intensive foreign counterintelligence operation against the, F, uh, against the KDP, nationally and in Seattle. We now have over 220 pages of documents from the Seattle office of the FBI detailing how they sent informants into the KDP, how they uh, monitored all the activities they were engaged in. They drew uh, diagrams of the headquarters they knew everybody's uh, social habits. It was an intensive FBI investigation going on at the same time that these murders happened. In other words, there was an FBI informant at the murders of someone who they were investigating. And the question therefore is raised, was Forsyth working for the FBI in its surveillance of the KDP? But that wasn't all. In addition to the counterintelligence investigation of the KDP. There was another investigation of a loan shark. A loan shark investigation resulted in the conviction of three people. Forsyth was suspected of being involved in this loan shark. This was an investigation run out of the Seattle office of the FBI. There's 1,276 pages of documents on Forsyth. We've asked for them, and we've only gotten, guess how many? 230 pages. They've kept 1,000 pages of what this guy was doing from us. And we got to get to the bottom and find out what is in those pages. But the most important thing was the same head of the FBI office in Seattle that was overseeing the counterintelligence operation against the KDP and was overseeing the murder investigation by Lee Zavala and his agents, was also aware that here is this man, Forsyth, who was at first a suspect, but then was turned and became an informant. And when was it that he was cleared of the investigation into the loan chart? June 3rd, 1981, three days, three days after he agreed to appear at the murders and write a report that exonerated the hitman. Was this a coincidence? Could it possibly be true that this man just happened to show up? That the FBI had no idea who it was. So these three, remember the interlocking circles of the murder conspiracy, we now have three interlocking circles. There's the counterintelligence operation against the KDP. There's this loan shark investigation in which Forsyth was used as an informant. And then there's the murder investigation. So who was it in common? What was the intersection of these three circles? A man named Paul J. Mack. You probably haven't heard that name. Paul J. Mack was a right-hand henchman for J. Edgar Hoover. For years and years, he was part of the COINTELPRO operation against many. He was a right-wing anti-communist to the, to the death. And he was transferred toward the end of the year to head the Seattle office of the FBI. He was the one that sat on top of all three of these investigations, along with his assistant, George Fisher. So when you look at those three concentric circles that intersect, our goal is to find out what was the center of that. 
Who sent Forsyth to the scene of the murders? Why didn't the FBI ever question Forsyth? Here, here was a, here is a Forsyth that's supposedly an eyewitness to the murders, and nobody bothers to question him in the murder investigation. Why was that? Why didn't they charge Forsyth with obstruction of justice by his perjured testimony at the Hitman trial? Was Forsyth used in the KDP investigation? Why were charges against Forsyth in the long chart investigation dropped three days after he shows up at the murder scene? We never got a chance to put all this stuff into testimony, did we, Linda? This is probably all news to you. Okay. <laughs> well, good. You know. Why has the FBI kept a thousand pages of this guy in secret? So that's the invitation I make to you. We have a petition. And the petition drive essentially makes this claim. The FBI promotes illegal misconducts by its informants, including murder, perjury, obstruction of justice, in order to protect its informants and to protect its interests and to protect itself, but also to deny justice to its many victims. That's the nature of the, this organization. And that's what we want to get to the bottom of. We need to press these claims. We need to charge the FBI with obstruction of justice and make sure that the incredible sacrifices that Gene and Selmy made and that all of us have made in our own ways in building this justice effort are not in vain. I hope you can read the book. I hope you get involved. I have a petition you can sign. If you go to michaelwithy.com, www.michaelwithy.com, not only can you see a wonderful video, you can see the slideshow I meant to show tonight. You can sign the petition, give us your email address, uh, we've been heartened by the fact that our Congresswoman Pr Pramila Jayapal is involved in our justice efforts. We're heartened by the fact that the press is starting to take an interest in this. And so we, um, uh, you know, it's uh, upward and onward, Cindy. Thank you so much for coming. You know, the other thing that I forgot to mention is uh, we've done a couple of book readings in the Philippines. And this book has been very important. And actually, um, the UW just signed an agreement to have the book published in the Philippines because there are many Filipinos that, don't, that never knew about the organizing that we did in this country or continue to do um, in the efforts to overthrow Duterte now. So, um, you know, hopefully that book will be out in the next six months and we'll be going to the Philippines again to do a book launching. So we're open to questions, if anybody has any. So the question is, did, was, was Forsyth put in the phone booth across from the Union Hall? No, we're convinced he was there. Yeah. I mean, one is I took his wife's deposition. She said he came back, and I just could tell she was telling the truth. He actually wrote a report dated at June 1st that, that he sent to his control agent. So the question is, well, who was it that might have sent him there? And there's a couple possibilities. One was, he was part of the surveillance of the KDP, the FBI investigation that the foreign, it's called the Foreign Counterintelligence Unit of the FBI in Seattle. Okay. And we know, I'm not gonna say publicly, but we, we know who they are. So he was there watching the Union Hall, seeing what was going on with Gene and Selmy, who's coming in, Dave Della was supposed to be there. He's gonna take names and figure that out. That's one possibility. The second is because of the FBI, as part of their counterintelligence, had gotten information from naval intelligence that Gene had traveled to the Philippines and supposedly had provided 290000 to the anti-Marcos opposition. It was only, he only had $2,900. And so therefore, and the FBI was always provided with that information. The, the Seattle office and the San Francisco office got the information that Gene had done this. Maybe someone figured out, gee, that's going to cost somebody their life given who Marcos is. That's another hypothesis. We don't know. But what we do know is that there are agents uh, of the foreign counterintelligence that were involved in the murder investigation. So stay tuned. This isn't over yet. And uh, we, we just think that um, they've got a lot of uh, uh, answering to do. It's a little different time. We fortunately don't have the Tulasan gang. We were mainly concerned about the Tulasan gang and these Marcos thugs. Well, there's 
maybe Duterte thugs, but it's not the same level of intimidation. So, other questions? Yes. Under FOIA, what's the <coughs> sorry? Under FOIA, what classification are they holding back on thousand pages? Or why is it that they had to respond with the if it's twenty or twenty? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, we, we filed this in June of 2015. All right, so it took them three years to give us one page, and we got 223. Number one, in terms of all three, we now have FBI, FOIs, and all three of those in circles. I'm sorry about. Number one, B1, guess what that is? National security. Any surprise there? Number two, personal privacy. 37 years later, some of these FBI agents aren't even alive. Number three, it would interfere with law enforcement. Give me a break. There's no ongoing law enforcement. And the fourth one is grand jury secrets, which is nonsense. So they're, they're making up excuses. And we fully intend, once, we, once our appeal is decided, to file in federal court. So there will be a federal court case of us against the FBI saying, you got to come clean, and we hope to have the support of all of you in doing that. Yeah, sorry, FOI is Freedom of Information Act. If, if the FBI murders people, I mean, what kind of justice can you expect? <laughs> well, we don't, we're not claiming the FBI murdered Gene and Somi. We know who murdered them. What we know is that they knew in advance and had somebody there. Well, first of all, we want to expose that. Listen, I, on the slideshow, I have the examples of five other FBI informants. How about the guy who killed um, Viola Luizzo, a civil rights activist, after the march to Montgomery as part of a KKK? He, he was involved in her murder and never was brought to justice. There's four other examples in which some people have achieved justice in civil suits, but what we want to do is expose the role of the FBI, find out, first of all, we want to find out who, who it was that sent Foresight there and what responsibility they have, but also we want to find out if the FBI, how the FBI knew these murders were going to happen, and do they know the name of the Philippine military lieutenant colonel who came to the United States in May of 1981 to make sure that the, these murders happened and got paid for. So to be able to expose that to us is very important. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you have to take a historical look at uh, the relationship between U.S. and the Philippines. So the U.S. intelligence has a long time interest in surveilling the member of the officers and leadership of the Alaska Canada Workers Union Local 37. So remember that during the 1930s and 40s, during the formation of that union, many of the leaders were communists. And at the same time, that's when the U.S. continued to look at, at the Philippines as a strategic investment and based, had two bases located in the Philippines. One of the, what Mike was talking about uh, in terms of U.S. military intelligence, they were surveilling the KDP as well. Uh, we have documents from the trial which shows that military intelligence were surveilling the KDP because of our activism, because of our opposition to the bases in the, United, in the Philippines. But we know that U.S. and Philippine intelligence had been surveilling our movements back from the 30s and 40s. And then maybe in the 1950s, once the communists were pushed out of the Union, the U.S. said, never mind, you know, the communists are gone from that Union. But when Salmi and Jean and others of the reform movement re-entered that Union and then especially took it over, intelligence was geared up again. And that included military intelligence as well as the FBI. So there's a collusion between all of our intelligence agencies and probably including the CIA. So. Um, you know, we, we have many, many documents from military intelligence to FBI. We think that at, uh, the FBI surveillance um, started from the beginnings of the KDP. Right. The documents that we got showed that 
at, in 1974, when the Seattle chapter was formed, they were surveilling and had already infiltrated the KDP. There are documents that show that were internal documents that they said were. Uh, <laughs> they found them in front of Titan Restaurant. <laughs> Right, who's gonna? Well, they have, they have, they right. named four, they don't name them, but they say there are four, there are four informants. Right. T1 through T4 right. in the KDP, including in the KDP. a meeting with only seven members of the KDP in Seattle. Right. And so we FBI think. Informants. FBI right. informants. Not naval. No, FBI. Right. Well, they had also had naval intelligence, right? Right. We had, right. We know that there were a, a handful of, of naval, ex naval people who are trying to infiltrate into the KDP as part of naval intelligence. So, um, you know, that kind of surveillance, the continuation of COINTELPRO, um, you know, and we know what surveillance is happening now, you know, in terms of Black Lives Matter uh, movement and harassment. Um, Mike was referring to a lieutenant colonel that came to this country. Uh, there was, um, you know, military, uh, Philippine military agents sent into this country with the complicity and knowledge of the U.S., of our U.S. government. And in the document, a defense intelligence agency document, which was used during the trial, which said these agents will surveil and possibly move against, and in intelligence language, moving against means using physical violence. Yes. So none of this is presented during the trials of the Soviet murders. And we have Linda here, who is one of the jurists. And I'm wondering what her thoughts are. Me too. <laughs> she, I have, I, I, I'm wondering, given. Is it just fine, do you think, to kind of share some of that? I would love yes. it. Do you want the mic, Linda? Right. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, yes. Once you have to do Linda Barber, folks. Tremendous voice of record. She doesn't age today. This is amazing. Do I want to what? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> um, the, the jury was really interesting. They're in a federal jury, there are just six. I was juror number six, and um, we, although we weren't to talk about the trial, which we did not, um, until it was time to do so, okay, until it was time to do so, we did talk about other things, and I felt that it was, and I'm kind of a shy person, but I felt that it was a pretty conservative group, and so I needed to be the foreman. <laughs> and it was called at the time a first juror. So I volunteered to do that because I was so sure that, that the Marcoses were guilty. And I believe there were two women and four men. Correct. Yes. And the, uh, one other man, when it came time to deliver, one other, to deliberate, one other man was pretty sure that um, they were guilty. And we took a vote the very first. And so four of the people were kind of on the fence, but no one was absolutely, they're not guilty. None of us, until I read the book, saw the smoking gun, however. So we were talking about the fact that the evidence looked like they were guilty, but especially one of the men kept saying, but there was no smoking gun. I don't know that I can go there. There was no smoking gun. But ultimately, um, we, we all came around to the fact, I took copious notes through the whole thing, people joked about that, and uh, came around to the fact that we were going to find them guilty. However, um, there was one woman, and she was just nuts. Um, <laughs> She, uh, she was going to try the whole thing in her own way, <coughs> that it probably was really a burglary. Um, and we were, at that point, five to one. And at one point, when we were so frustrated, trying to be nice, because we thought, what is she even doing here? Um, she said, well, she needed to go to the bathroom. 
So she went off to the bathroom. I mean, this kind of thing I remember about this trial, right? <laughs> and uh, so the five of us were kind of sitting there looking at each other because we had really nothing to say because we had all agreed at that point that we were going to find them guilty. And she was gone a long time. I thought, should I go in and get her? And well, we sat there and nobody was saying anything because what was there to talk about? And so other than her. And so she, she finally came out and she said, what did I miss? And, <laughs> and it was so frustrating. <laughs> it was so frustrating. Um, I have no idea what that one juror on the Manafort trial was not too long ago. <laughs> But I thought immediately of her because I was reading the book at the time. So, and then, and then we, so she, I, she, we said, well, what are we going to do? Um, well, she said, well, I guess you're all in agreement. So I guess, I'll, I guess I'll vote guilty too. So we thought, great. Then we went into the how much money should we give. And at that point, she was, she didn't say much, but she was kind of on board, we were hoping. But then we were really afraid because then she kept vacillating. And then we were really afraid that if they took an individual vote, I remember asking her, if they ask us individually how each one of us feel, are you going to be able to say guilty? And she said yes. But we were really glad they didn't take that vote. No, <laughs> because we were really nervous about her. So that was pretty much what I remember from almost 30 years ago. So um, well, I, Linda I think... Linda came to the victory party, thank you very much, and talked about wish wishing you had known Jean and Selmy, but it also, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about how it, how it changed your life. Oh, that's fine. Could you? Yeah. Oh, Thank I you. can. Um, I, had, I was so excited to be number one, the first thing, just gone from my job because I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, uh, but I, what it did do is that there were so many people working for justice, and it was so meaningful to me. The trial was so meaningful to me that I thought, I want to do something in my life that is meaningful. So that spring, even though we had two kids in college at the time, I went home and said to my husband, I've got to start school. I've got to start my master's program. I've got to. I, I can't do this anymore. I want to do something uh, before I'm dead that, um, that, is, that is meaningful. And so that's what I did. And so I also attribute that in my own personal life to a kind of a new start for me. And I'm still working. So I'm 78 and still working. So I still, <laughs> so, I, I, so I love what I do. I love what I do. And I, I, work, with, I work with families and helping Social families. Yep. There's a question from the audience. For oh, that's what I was going to ask. Oh, okay, what do you do? Well, actually, I work in parent education, so it's not really social work. And I'm faculty at Seattle Central College. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for Are there any other questions? We have books to sign and inscriptions. Go ahead, Randy. But I, I had my questions. <laughs> no, no. That's absolutely true. The question, well, first of all, even though you read in the book about Forsyth, the jurors never heard about Forsyth. So she, she had to wait to read the book. But the added information that, that now we know of the interlocking three investigations and Forsyth being an informant for the FBI in Seattle, that's new. Um, but, you know, the judge just didn't want to hear anything about, you know, some FBI informants. So. And Forsyth wasn't in our trial at all. That was in the real Yep. Oh, yes. Linda makes makes a good point, which and, and it relates to what Cindy said, which is under Reagan, a free hand. This is Reagan came in in January of 1981, 81, and he was and and Marcos and, and Imelda told people this. 
Well, now our guy's in there. You guys are in trouble, speaking of the uh, Marcos opposition in the U.S. So there was a heightened surveillance. There was a heightened intimidation of the U.S.-based Marcos opposition after Reagan came in. Some of the State Department documents we got in the, that we admitted in the trial were in the Carter years, warning Marcos, you know, stop your spying and, you know, in the U.S., what are you thinking about? That all changed under Reagan, which shows the connection between, you know, the U.S. Uh, military and U.S. intelligence in the Marcos regime that was operating there. Mindy. Uh, what about now? I mean, do you think there's some analogy between Trump and yeah, don't you? <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, it's a very different relationship now between the United States and the Philippines. The, the U.S. is no longer the major determinant, determinant of what happens in the Philippines because the bases are gone. So it's, it's a different political situation. So there is uh, tension between Trump and Duterte. <laughs> and same with Duterte, you know. Yeah. So they're very similar in terms of, you know, as I was saying, their misogyny, their use of uh, uh, misinformation. Summary uh, execution. Well, uh, <laughs> Trump said that he really likes Duterte's uh, war against drugs, so he wishes he could use that tactic. But it's a different political situation now. Uh, but what's similar is the, um, the danger of uh, human rights in the Philippines and the democratic space that was created after the overthrow of the dictator, Marcos, is now in great danger. And in fact, you know, we feel that in the United States, the Filipino community needs to mobilize again. And uh, we are considering forming another national organization early next year to organize the Filipino community uh, in the fight to save uh, what democratic space still uh, exists in the Philippines. So. Great. Thank you all for coming. We have books.